Well, we're looking in the book of Revelation in these days. Anybody read through the book of Revelation yet? As you're reading through this, we're looking at the next couple of chapters that bring us to uh, the trumpets that we're going to talk about today. Now, I don't know how you, uh, uh, how, many, how many of you have ever played a trumpet? Anybody ever played a trumpet in this crowd? Yeah. Oh, played a trumpet. I played a trumpet and I got rid of mine or I brought it this morning. Um, had, a, had a trumpet. You know, it's an amazing thing when you play a trumpet, the part they play in a band or in the context in which they are in. If you played a trumpet in the band, we used to have to blend in, and we were often the ones in the band that the, that the conductor would try to get us to be a little quieter so, you know, the flutes and the clarinets could come out and have their part and the trumpets. And sometimes they would give us what they had to... If you ever seen a trumpet, they give you a mute. They actually create a mute where you put the mute in, in inside your, the bell of your trumpet and it would quiet all the trumpets down so that the other instruments could excel at a certain place in the music. And then there was the jazz bands that we got into and, and that was kind of, uh, you had to work that out and there had to be a blending of the instruments in the jazz band. But there was one application of the trumpet that I always looked forward to where we could open it up and blow our heads off right out through our trumpet. I mean, you get blasted away and nobody cared. And that was on Friday night at the pep band at the basketball games. Boy, you could let her rip and nobody cared. The trumpets were the feature of the pep band because they call us to energy and they suggest to us energy. Well, in the Bible times, the trumpet had many, many applications as well. And we begin to find that in the scripture that sometimes they were used to sound the alarm for the military to attack. There were other times when they were called to retreat and the trumpet would sound a retreat sound that, would, that everybody knew what that was in their lives. And then there was the trumpet that was used to announce good news or to announce the victory of an army that was coming home from battle. There was the trumpets that we find in the Bible that brought about the enthronement of a new king. We'd hear the trumpet sound or oftentimes on the celebration of many of the Jewish holidays that would always be involved the sound of a trumpet in that coming. Well, the Bible also tells us in the New Testament that when Jesus comes again, that the trumpet, the instrument, the trumpet will sound. In fact, it tells us as we've looked at this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Can you imagine what that's going to look like in the cemeteries? <laughs> when that happens, they will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up into the clouds to meet them in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So the trumpet is used, will be used to announce the moment when Christ comes again to bring his kingdom to earth. Now, in the scriptures, what we begin to find beginning in chapter 8, we've come through the seals. You remember the seals have been opened up by the, the scroll of the seals have been opened up by Jesus, the slaughtered lamb in chapter 5. And now we're beginning to see an increase in the judgments of God. And the early church would have heard this read out loud. So this morning, we're going to read a, a, a couple of chapters here out loud. And I'll make some commentary on it. Then I want to draw some points out of this and bring us to the communion table of the Lord. Because what we will partake of today comes exactly out of what we're talking about with the giving of the body and the blood of the slaughtered lamb for our salvation. So as we come to deal with this, 
Let me just remind you again that there are five ways that the book of Revelation has been interpreted. And I've given them to you in the past. Let me just list them here quickly. The Petrist view that simply believes that they're going to be delivered from the Roman Empire in the present. There's the history, historist view in which they see it as a prophetic outline of, of what's going to go happening in the church. There's a futurist view where it believes this whole book is about the future. And then there's the idealist view that says it's just all symbolic and we're supposed to get some principles to live by that generally we can live by in this world. Or there is, as I've suggested, the best way to handle it is the eclectic view, which simply says there are future portions of this, there are present day portions of this, there is history in this, and we have to learn how to read the whole of Scripture when we come to the apocalyptic literature, which we remember, it means revealing. It doesn't mean just the destruction at the end. Apocalyptic literature is simply saying to us, here's a revelation of what God's saying to us that will happen in any given time, including the end. So we come to this passage of Scripture, and suddenly the last seal after some silence in heaven, breaks through with the sounding of seven trumpets. Now, when you begin to read what we're going to read this morning, there is to come after this seven bowls, several chapters from now. But these bowls and trumpets and seals all are describing the same thing, but in an escalation. Think of it, I like to think of it, as concentric circles or as the tide, there is this ebb and flow of a tide coming in. It goes back out. It comes in again a little stronger. It goes back out. It comes in a little bit stronger. And then there is the moment, and you never know when it's going to be, that the tidal, the tide coming in suddenly becomes a tidal wave that washes clear in and covers the whole land, like sometimes happens with an earthquake or a... Um, hurricane, the tidal wave. So we're beginning to see the escalation. You'll sense that this morning. And I want us to read this. I'm going to read it out loud in your Bibles, beginning in verse 8. And I want you to think about this. You're in the early church. If you'd have heard this for the very first time, you would have heard the pastor of the church reading this as a letter from John out loud this was the Sunday morning message. Here's the vision we've got from John, who is being persecuted and exiled on the island of Patmos. Here's what he's speaking to the seven churches. Here's what he's speaking to all of the churches. Let him who hears what the Spirit says to the churches, as we've read in earlier chapters, and we begin to see this happen. So beginning in verse 8 of Revelation chapter 8, here's what we hear here is what we read. Then the second angel blew his trumpet. And a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea and one third of the water in the sea became blood. Now we, we immediately have Exodus, the story of the Exodus plagues that you begin to see happening out of this. And I, I just started at verse 8. Actually, we started verse 6. There was the first trumpet in which hail and fire mixed with blood was thrown down on the earth and one third of the earth was set on fire and one third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned. And we begin to see again these plagues. And it brings to mind what the scripture has also told us. Peter told us that there would come a time when the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare and burned up. I want you to notice a couple of things here. The scripture is telling us that a third will be burned up, which suggests that there is limits to the judgment of God and that, that there is the mercy of God even in the midst of judgment. It begins with just a third of the earth that's burned up. It's limited. There is a burning that begins to take place. Now, 
There are some who would believe that somehow the world, as the whole planet of earth, is just going to blow up into smithereens. That's not what the scripture language seems to suggest here. It's telling us that like a fire clears out a forest for new growth, that God will eventually totally bring fire on all the earth to bring in the new growth, the new heavens and the new earth. He's still not going to destroy the planet because he created this planet and he called it very good in the book of creation. So he's not going to destroy the planet. He's simply going to renew it and create a new heaven and a new earth and the fire will be used to bring that about. Now we begin to read in verse 10. Then the third angel blew his trumpet. And a great star fell from the sky, burning like a torch, and it fell on one third of the rivers and on the springs of the water. And the name of the star was Wormwood or Bitterness. The word means bitterness. And it made one third of the water poisonous, and many people died from drinking the bitter water. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet. And one third of the sun was struck and one third of the moon and one third of the stars. And we have now darkness <coughs> over the earth and one third of the day was dark and one third of the night. And then I looked and I heard it single eagle crying loudly as it flew through the air. Terror, terror, terror to all who belong to this world because of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. And so there's this pause that begins to take place in the heavenlies as if God is waiting to see, is there any repentance? We'll see here in a moment. That's the purpose of God in judgment. Is there going to be any repentance? He pauses for a moment in the heavenlies. What's going to happen next? Will anything take place in their lives? There's no repentance. So in chapter 9, we begin to read the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And then the fifth angel, after they blew their trumpet, the star had fallen to the earth from the sky, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And when he opened it, smoke poured out as through from a huge furnace and the sunlight and air turned dark from the smoke. Now some think that this is describing Satan, That's, that he will come later in the book. This is the angel of God who has the keys to the bottomless pit where the demonic spirits have been held at bay from having full access to what's going on in the power. It's the, re the resistance. It's the delay. It's the, it's the block that's kept them from having full access to the human race. And so this angel goes to this bottomless pit. And when he does, he opens it up. Now look what begins to happen. Locusts came from the smoke and descended on the earth and they were given the power to sting like scorpions. They were told, do not harm the grass or the plants or the trees, but only the people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Oh, circle that, mark that. Notice here, God's judgment is not coming to the righteous, but they're evidently going to be present at this giving of the judgment of God, but God will protect them because they will have a seal on them. And we've talked about the seal being... The, the work of the Holy Spirit in one's heart, the seal that's symbolized on their foreheads that will protect them. So notice what happens next. They were told not to kill them, but to torture them for five months with pain like the pain of a scorpion sting. In those days, people will want to die. 
but they won't be able to find death. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. And the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. They had what looked like gold crowns on their heads and their faces looked like human faces and they had hair like women's hair and teeth like the teeth of a lion and they wore armor made of iron and their wings roared like an army of chariots rushing into battle. They had tails that stung like court scorpions and for five months they had the power to torment people and their king is the angel from the bottomless pit. Here is Satan introduced now. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollon, which simply means he's the destroyer or the torturer. And the first tear is past, but look, there are two more tears that are coming. Now, what in the world are we talking about? In the biblical world, the worst thing that could happen to a nation is for swarms of locusts that often came if you read the history of the Old Testament, locusts would come and they would literally strip the crops. They would literally strip green trees. I've seen pictures of trees, fig trees that, that were in full blossom. And when the swarm of locusts moved through, when they were done in just a day or two, totally blank looking like a tree that had lost its leaves in the fall, totally no greenery left anywhere. And the book of Joel and the prophets talked about God's judgment coming to the nation of Israel because of their idolatry and their turning from their turning from God to sin in their lives that the locusts would be allowed to come and strip them bare. So the worst thing that you could think of that would destroy a nation was the locusts. That's what's being symbolized here. Now it's interesting the way they're described because they're described with all of these features and these human faces and their armor made of iron and their rings wore like an army of chariots rushing into battle. Now, if you were sitting in the first century church and you heard this, you would have some context with the Parthenians who were just the nation east of you. They were a powerful military kingdom. And they had some unique battle techniques that made them extremely dangerous to the people of God and the people of Israel. They had the habits, they would come with huge iron that other armies did not have. They would be covered with breastplates, but they had an unusual technique. They had learned how to ride their horses backwards so that the sting came out of the horse's tail because they were shooting from the back end of the horse in the reverse to the enemy that was pursuing them. Then they also had another technique that was particularly devastating to the Roman army as well in that day. And that was is that when they would come to a certain place in the battle, they would get over next to a hill or a mountain, and they had learned to ride backwards on their horses up the mountain, and then the army would pursue them up the mountain, but they had the advantage shooting a volley of arrows that would wipe out many of the Roman soldiers that were coming in that direction. So they would have had in their minds, as they read this, the Parthenians who would swarm like locusts, had iron, had human faces, and had the ability to destroy with the sting coming from the rear end of the horse, and their, their, their teeth of their breastplates in iron would, would have been the images and pictures that they had. Now for us, it's interesting, if you put this in the 21st century, what would you think of as you describe this kind of thing? There have been those who have said, that sounds like some of the power of our helicopters in the military, where they shoot out the tail of a helicopter and they have all kinds of paintings on huge iron. And if you were trying to describe helicopters in the first century, as we see them today, how would you have described it? What language would you have used? It would not be unusual that they would pick up this language to describe what they, what John saw in his vision, but had no name for or no understanding of what it was. And so we have the locust here as the judgment of God that begins to fall on them and they begin to experience the judgment of God. Then comes the sixth angel in verse 13, who blew his trumpet. Now, 
And I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the gold altar that stand in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. Where did creation start? Where was the Garden of Eden? Right at the apex of the Euphrates River, where the rivers came together. So now the image here, we're right back where creation started before sin, before judgment, before anything. We're back at the Euphrates River and there are four angels who have been bound there. And these four angels have been prepared for this hour and day and month and year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on the earth. And I heard the size of their army, which was 200 million mounted troops. Now to give you an idea of this, they tell us that our US military, the largest in the world, is 1.3 million. This is 200 million. Huge, huge horde of creatures that are coming out in this direction. And I saw the horse and the rider sitting on them and the riders wore armor that was fiery red and dark and blue and yellow and the horses had heads like lions and fire, smoke and burning sulfur billowed from their mouths. And one third of all the people on the earth were killed by these three plagues, by the fire, the smoke and the burning sulfur that came from the mouths of the horses and their power was in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails had heads like snakes with the power to injure people. But the people who did not die in these plagues still refused to repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. They continued to worship demons. They continued to worship idols made of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood and idols that can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders. They did not repent of their witchcraft. They did not repent of their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now we have here this 200 million. Who are these? Well, if you take this in the symbolic fashion of the scripture, this would seem to be coming out of as locusts coming out of the bottomless pit. This is a release of demonic spirits like we've never seen on the face of the earth with everything being released to influence those who have refused to repent. The demonic hordes come out against them. Now there are those scholars who have talked about this. If you see it in a literal sense that they would say this suggests uh, the armies that would later in other parts of the scripture that is predicted will come from the east namely China and Russia and the spring Arab spring nations that will come eventually against Israel in a great battle. It's not real clear that that's what this means. I would say it, it, it talks about the demonic spirits coming out of the bottomless pit that will be released, but it could be a physical army that's coming with tanks and all kinds of, of military apparatus and machinery that would come against that are described here. That's where they get it. This is where they would get the literal understanding of that. But I want you to notice verse 20. The whole purpose of the judgments coming on the earth is not because God got mad one day and said, I've had it up here and I'm getting you. God has always been angry and judging sin. It's, it's not a flash of emotion for him. It's the constant position that he lives in. You and I get mad about something, we have a reaction to it, and then we cool off somewhere. No, God has always been moving against evil and sin. And what the scripture tells us here is that when God allows judgment to come, it's always for the purpose of bringing people to repentance in their lives. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Now we come to chapter 10 and there is this pause and there's another vision. And I saw another mighty angel coming down from the heavens surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head and his face shone like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire and in his hand 
was a small scroll. I want you to notice here that the rainbow is mentioned again. Let me just say to you, the rainbow does not belong to one group with some agenda in their lives. The rainbow biblically has always been a symbol that belonged to God. It belongs to God who used it to show both judgment and mercy. You remember the story of Noah? At the end, God said, I'm not going to flood the earth no more. And he gave him half a rainbow. Here in the book of Revelation, we have the whole rainbow that is symbolic around the throne of God. God owns the symbol of the rainbow, not some group, an agenda in a culture that is trying to go in a different direction than the righteousness of God in sexual immorality. So the rainbow here becomes the symbol of, of God coming, and now we have this little scroll that shows up again. You remember the scroll that we had? We had the sealed scroll and the open scroll. Jesus, the slaughtered lamb, had, lamb, had the scroll of the ownership of the earth. That seems to be the picture here again. In his hand, it's great. And he opened it, and he stood with his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and he gave a great shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted... The seven thunders answered. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying, don't write that, keep it secret. What the seven thunders have said and do not <coughs> write it down. Now let me pause there just a moment. This is why we cannot become overly dogmatic about any part of the end times. Because this is one of several places in which God himself said to Daniel in one case and to John in another case, there's a part of the revelation we're not going to publicize. It's not going to be public. You don't get to know this. You don't get to know what the seven thunders said. That will come later. That will come at the end. You will not know that till we get to the end. <coughs> Seal it up. And so there are many things we don't know, but we need to pay attention to what is revealed. So here's what he said. The angel I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand toward the heavens. And he swore an oath in the name of the one who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and everything in them and earth and everything in it and the sea and everything in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. When the seven angels blows his trumpet, God's mysterious plan will be fulfilled. It will happen just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. What's the mysterious plan? Paul talks about the mysterious plan, the mystery of the gospel. We're going to see how that plays out here. Then a voice from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the open scroll from the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and told him to give me the small scroll. Yes, take it and eat it, he said. It will be sweet as honey in your mouth, but it will turn sour in your stomach. So I took the small scroll from the hand of the angel and I ate it. And it was sweet in my mouth. But when I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. What's happening here? This is the scroll that is the title deed to the earth that was stolen by Satan through the sin of Adam. And Jesus is redeeming the earth and all who will turn to him in repentance and bring them back into the kingdom of God. And in this scroll is the title deed to earth. But the angel is telling them there's a sweetness and a bitterness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's, what's the sweetness? Well, the sweetness is that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We deserved the devil's hell. But Jesus Christ through the cross has come and paid and purchased our redemption. And he is, that's the sweetness. But the bitterness is that it took the cross to do it. It took his own blood. It took his own suffering. It took his own persecution. It took the judgment of God upon Jesus himself to bring that. That's the bitterness that purchases the good news of our salvation. And John says, 
You're going to take this message to all the nations and the peoples and the languages, and it's going to be good news and bad news. It's going to be sweet news and bitter news. Because in the middle of this, there is a price to be paid for the redemption. There is the persecution of the church. There is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There is the suffering that brings about our salvation. And sometimes we have a struggle because we think that, that salvation simply is the sweetness of the gospel that saved a wretch like me. And we sang it this morning, you're amazing, amazing. But many times we forget the fact that it costs a great deal for our salvation. Our salvation is not cheap. It's very expensive and it comes through the process of suffering. Now we come to the two witnesses. I was given a measuring stick and I was told, go measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshipers, but don't measure the outer court for it has been turned over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months and I will give power to my two witnesses and they will be clothed in burlap and prophesy during these 1,260 days. And these two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. And if anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them will die. They have power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and the oceans in blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. And when they complete their testimony, the beast comes out of the bottomless pit, will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified. And for three and a half days, all the peoples, tribes, late nations, and languages will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them, and all the people who belong to this world will gloat over them, and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. But after three and a half days, God breathes life back into them and they stood up and terror struck all those who were staring at them. And then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. And at the same time, there was this terrible earthquake that destroyed the tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in that earthquake and everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second terror is past, but look, it's not over yet. The third terror is coming quickly. What are we talking about here? Who are the two witnesses? Well, if you take it literally, there are those who believe that there will come in a period of tribulation a seven year period of tribulation, two witnesses, and they've been identified as those who have the prophets of the past, like Elijah and Elisha perhaps are popular ones because Elisha and Elijah never died. They were taken up in a cloud. There is Moses who is believed that he really never died, that he went up into a mountain and he was not. The scripture talks about that. And so they, there are those who believe that these witnesses will literally come back to earth. They will prophesy and share the gospel with the world and eventually will be killed and then they'll be resurrected and there will be this great revival in which everybody but 7,000 are saved. Now this one right and read it. Or you can read it that if we stay with the symbolic nature of what the church would have heard in the seven churches that these two witnesses coming out of the book of Zechariah are a symbol of the whole church, the witness of the Christian church that's ministering to the nations and all the peoples and the languages and the kings and that the church will be, will be persecuted and eventually its voice will be silenced and everybody will celebrate that the church is gone. Now, if you want a picture of that in some small matter, it just came out in the news this week, and I was talking to Pastor Notori about this. 10,000 churches have been closed in Rwanda in the last few weeks. You know why? The government has come out and said the pastors are not trained properly and their buildings are not safe. I went to Pastor Notori. I said, is this a political power or is this a real problem in your country? He said, oh, no. He said the president has been elected uh, for the last 30 years 
every seven years is election, but he said it's always corrupt and he always wins. And the church has been a great threat to his power of staying in his power as president. And they need to shut it down, so they found a reason. They can simply say the pastors aren't trained and the buildings aren't safe, and they shut down 10,000 churches. Can I say to you that we live in a world that if they had their way, in, in many places in the world, including the United States, there is a spirit in our nation, in our world, that would shut down and silence the church, and they're willing to go to any measure to make it do it in the name of good reason for your, for your safety, for your health. We're shutting down the church. That's what's happening here. And then the church comes back resurrected by God himself in the same way that Jesus was persecuted, put in the tomb, and in three days, Jesus was resurrected again in the resurrection power, and many then come to believe the gospel because of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. John is saying to us that the church cannot be silenced. The church cannot be shut down. The message of the gospel will not be shut down. And when it seems that it has been shut down, God will resurrect it even to the last day. And the message of the gospel will go forward in the name of Jesus. Then we come to the seventh trumpet that brings the third terror. loud voices shouting in heaven the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ and he will reign forever and forever and the 24 elders sitting on their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshipped him and they said we give thanks to you O Lord the God Almighty the one who is and who always was for now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign and the nations were filled with wrath, but the time of your wrath has come. It is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name from the least to the greatest. It's time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. And then the heaven, the temple of God was open and the ark of the covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed and thunder crashed and roared and there was this earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. We have another worship service at the end of the seven trumpets in the heavenlies. And notice that there is going to be a judgment for every single person on the face of the earth who's ever lived. They're going to be judged for either the evil deeds that they have done or for the righteous deeds that they have done. Notice that all will be judged. The dead and all will be rewarded either with, with judgment or with rewards that God will give to those who fear his name and he will begin to reign. And the picture here for the Jewish congregation was the Ark of the Covenant in the temple that was wiped out in the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. There's no more temple. There's no more Ark of the Covenant. But John says, I saw the Ark of the Covenant, and most Jews believe that when the temple was destroyed, God took the Ark of the Covenant and hid it somewhere. They don't know where it's at. They've been looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And John says, I saw it. <laughs> I saw it. It's in the New Jerusalem. It's in the New City. And I saw the Ark of the Covenant that becomes the symbol of the reconciliation of man and God. Now, when we look at this whole thing, and we, we look at this whole passage, let me, let me just wrap this up and then say to you, what do we take away from this? If you interpret this literally, then you believe that there will come a rapture in which Jesus will come back to earth in a secret rapture and rapture every believer into heaven, which will begin a seven-year period of tribulation on the earth ruled by a antichrist government of unified government of the whole world that will be under this antichrist and there will be a rebuilding of the literal physical temple in Jerusalem 
and that there will begin the sacrifices again in the, the temple and the outer courts that were for the Gentiles in the Old Testament, the outer courts will be trampled by the nations who will seek to come against Israel and this seven year period will go on. The two witnesses will show up in this seven year tribulation. They will be resurrected and eventually Christ will come again and there will be those who have been saved through the tribulation and all will come together then for the reigning of a thousand years. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. The thousand year reign in which Christ will rule in a, a physical sense over the whole earth in their lives. Now, where do we get this? Well, that view comes from a man by the name of Tom Darby or John Darby in the 19th century in Ireland who got disenchanted with the church, began to read the Bible, came up with his own interpretation and a sketchy guy, you can read the history, a sketchy guy by the name of Schofield who eventually wrote his own version of the Bible on the basis of his view of prophecy, put this that influenced the whole Christian church clear across the continent in many ways in the 19th century. And it was solidified by a 15 year old girl, an Irish girl who had a dream that kind of confirmed that these things were true, what were being taught by these, these men. And if you, if you ascribe to that, then what you're looking for next is the rapture and you're looking for the signs of the antichrist. You're looking for anywhere and that's what's happened over the last 30 years and there's been all kinds of suggestions about who the antichrist is hitler some thought it was hitler mussolini some thought it was thought, some thought it was henry kissinger you remember him <laughs> some thought it would be a russian jew some thought it would be obama <laughs> which is interesting in our day some have even suggested it would be the president of the world health organization and and they believe that there'll be this revival of the roman empire the european union and China, Russia, and the Arab Spring nations will come against the nation of Israel. Now, there are elements of that that the Bible talks about in Ezekiel and Daniel that may be very true. And if you're interpreting it that way, you'll be looking for all of that. But the immediate context of Revelation to the seven churches and this scroll that's the title deed of redemption of the gospel and this bitter and sweet preaching of the gospel that we've just seen here in which the temple is the people of God with the outer courts are the people of God persecuted by the pagan nations and systems. And if we see these two witnesses, the, the whole church universal being persecuted and resurrected and we begin to understand that God releases demonic hordes on the earth in a way that we have not seen in our time or in our day and that they will virtually try to shut down the kingdom of God and the church then it begins to give us a different view of this picture that we might miss if we only embrace a literal interpretation and it is out of this some uh, seven trumpets then that God speaks now what do we what do we take away from this what does this have to do with Monday morning and what I have to face this week and what's going on in my world and what's going on in our world what what in the world do I take away in fact there are those scholars who would rail against the book of Revelation in fact, I, I was reading some of those, some of these scholars who have said some things like, for instance, the psychologist Carl Jung, who read the book of Revelation and then scoffed and said, it's an orgy of hatred and wrath and vindictiveness and blind, destructive fury. Well, you could read it that way. There, there was another scholar, Dominic Crosen, who claims that Revelation turns the nonviolent resistance of the slaughtered Jesus into a violent warfare of the slaughtering Jesus. Notice here that there is no place where the people of God are instructed to go to war and build a military to go fight all the physical demons of the world. The message of this book is, is that God will fight his own battles and we will have to stand and in some cases be martyred for the sake of the gospel. But all of it, God is working into it for good. Now, there's 
a couple of things I want you to know in closing that you need to know about the judgment of God. This is the, this is the issue. If you get bogged down in all the imagery of this, you'll miss the main message. And here's, here's the fact that you need to know. And judgment is not a popular theme. You won't find too many churches today of any pastor preaching on the judgment. I'll guarantee you that. You won't find it anywhere. We don't preach on the judgment of God because God is loving, right? He's only loving. But what we begin to understand is the judgment of God is not contradictory to the God whose character is holy love. And in fact, his judgment flows out of his character of holy love. You say, well, how do you, how do you get to that, Pastor? Well, let me just say, here's how I hear it in the culture. Here's what I hear some of us say. God's mad at me. You ever heard anybody say that? God must be mad at me. Because what's going on in life, God must be mad at me. No. The scripture teaches us that God is not mad at you. He's rather madly in love with you. And he's angry about anything that would seek to destroy you. That's the truth. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. Here's another one I hear. People say to me, oh, often, I hear this often when I'm out in the community. They'll say when disaster, we'll often hear it when disaster strikes. Well, it was an act of God. Insurance companies love to talk about that. We're not responsible. It's an act of God. No. The question is, if that's true, why is he acting that way? Why did God send the tornado to Winterset, Iowa? Or Greenfield? If that's the way we're going to think about this. Why, why is it that God, if it's an act of God, why is he wiping out these towns? The reality is, the act of God is not the destruction of things. The act of God is to protect and save and preserve, not punish and strike and pulverize. That is not the God of holy love. He is seeking to preserve and to save and to protect, not punish and strike and pulverize you. Well, if that's true, then how do you account for seven trumpets and seven bowls and seven and God's judgment on our life? Well, that's because you need to think biblically. Here's what the scripture teaches us. What are, what, are, what, what are we dealing with in this? And it's this. Here's some things you need to know about God's judgment this week. It'll change the way you live this week if you think about the judgment of God in this way. And the first one is the judgment of God is a result of the prayers of God's people. Clear back. You remember in chapter 5, chapter 6, the prayers of the saints under the altar have been murdered by the, by the kingdom of this world, they're praying for justice and for the vengeance of God to come and make things right with a new heaven and a new earth. And God says, I'm going to answer that prayer, but not as fast as you thought and not in the way you would have thought I would. It comes from the result of the prayers of God's people. But here's the question for us. What are you praying for these days? You pray for prosperity. You pray that you just have wonderful health for your family and that everything will go good in your life. Or are you praying for the justice and the righteousness of God to prevail in the midst of his mercy? Are you praying that truth will be revealed? Are you praying that the kingdom will come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And I dare say to you that the, that the concern I have these days is that the church is not doing much praying about the kingdom coming on. We want the kingdom to come on earth in our terms for our benefit. And the message of Revelation is, no, the prayers of God's people for justice, God's going to do it. But in order to bring the justice, there has to be the judgment of God on our lives. But wait a minute. What if it's my children or my relatives who are lost? Do I care enough about them 
to pray that God's kingdom and that his justice will come to them to bring them to repentance? Or am I saying to God, I would rather them have a nice life and lose their soul in eternity? Or would we pray, oh God, whatever you got to do to save my kid, whatever you got to do, remember mercy, but whatever you got to do to get through to them, do it. It's the prayers of God's people that bring the judgment of God that brings the salvation and repentance in their lives. Second thing you need to know about the judgment of God is that it's certain against all evil. It's a warning alarm to the churches. And the Bible says that judgment of God begins not with the world, but the judgment begins right here in the church. First Peter wrote these words in chapter 4, verse 17, for the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's church, God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? What's the idolatry and the compromise in the church today? The immorality, the lack of repentance. Like the persons who eat, who refuse to eat properly, even when they know there is unhealthy choices, and they know it'll bring disastrous results, but we do it anyway. That's what God sees. The judgment comes. He, he gives them warning, and, and it escalates, and they don't respond in repentance. And the message of the context of the seven churches is that God's judgment is not his last act, but it's his early move to try to get our attention to redeem us. And to bring us back to loyalty to him. And there has to be a shaking in order to bring an allegiance back to the lamb. And the third thing that we need to learn about the judgment of God is that it's always for the purpose of repentance, not punishment. God is not interested in punishing you. Dan B. Boone put it this way, the judgment of God is our salvation. The word doesn't simply mean damnation or condemnation. It's a righteous verdict. It's kind of like your children. I remember when Andrea was just a little little gal and we were back before dishwashers and, 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 and we'd be doing dishes and she wanted to help, but she wanted to stick her hand into the scalding hot water that we were rinsing the dishes. Now some of you are going to think I'm just a terrible father and sadistic and all that kind of stuff, but just stick with it. And she tried to get her little hand up over that, I don't know if you remember that, she tried to get her hand up in that water and she kept insisting on it. So I let it cool off a little bit until it wasn't just scalding, scalding hot. And so the time came, she kept insisting on that. And so I, I just said, go ahead. And she reached her hand up in there. And she's been scarred ever since. It cost her a lot of years in counseling. Oh, I don't know. But you know what? She never touched the hot water again. She never again wanted to touch that. God does the same thing with us. I remember Martin. He, he wanted to hit his sisters and beat up on his sisters at a particular stage of his life. And, and you could talk to him and reason with him all day long. He wouldn't listen to you. So we administered the Board of Education. And you know, it was amazing. Now, I, I wasn't stupid. His chemicals in his brain weren't formed. He wasn't thinking, I shouldn't hit my sisters anymore when he got, when he got disciplined. No, in his brain, he was thinking, you know what? I don't think I'm going to hit my sisters anymore because every time I do, my bottom hurts. That's the way he thinks. That's the judgment of God works in the same kind of way. It's not out to hurt us. It's trying to get our attention. Can I ask you this question this morning? What does it take for God to get your attention? What does he have to do to get your attention? Can he simply speak a word of correction? Don't go there. We, aren't, we don't need that. That's not for you. Don't do that. You don't want to touch that. Or are we bound we're going to do it anyway and try it? And God has to allow the consequences to begin to fall on us before we finally get through. One of the prayers of my life have been throughout my life is, Lord, could I get to a place where you don't have to let judgment fall on me, but you, all you have to do is speak to me. 
and I change and I move and I repent and I do what God's asked me to do. What does God have to do to you? The scripture says here that even after all the judgments, there were those who would not repent even after it was ramped up. God's desire is to bring you to repentance in your life. And the fourth one is this. God's kingdom is going to win. His kingdom will prevail. N.T. Wright tells the story of Bill Clem, who's a famous umpire in the Major League Baseball. He was known to answer a batter's question when they would say, is that a ball or a strike? And he would say, it ain't nothing till I call it. God's going to have the final say on what happens in this world. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders sitting on the throne, they will fall down and they would say, give thanks to God Almighty. There's this huge worship service. And we are called, lastly this morning, to be faithful witnesses in a hostile world. Craig Keener made this comment about this, this whole subject. Today in a world where three out of four persons have yet to believe in Jesus Christ and at least two out of every four have yet to hear of Jesus Christ, if a congregation is not reproducing itself, it's not a New Testament church, no matter what it calls itself. Are we being faithful witnesses? You say that's scary. What are you afraid of? What's the worst thing that's going to happen to you if you witness for Jesus Christ to your friends and your neighbor? Rejection? Death? What will happen? You see, when the church is no longer on mission, she can't survive. And the example, best examples go back to Scripture. You realize that none of the seven churches that Jesus warned in this book exist today? They all went extinct. There's no church. These churches all were in modern day Turkey. There's no Christian churches in Turkey. They evidently didn't heed the warnings of John's revelation and the compromise and the complacency and the idolatry took away their faithful witness. God says, I will prevail and I will have my kingdom come and I will have my faithful witnesses you and I have a choice about that. You see, we have a choice to be a part of the kingdom that is here, but there's a part of the kingdom that is not yet. A kingdom already, a kingdom not yet. We're being asked to join the kingdom that is yet to come. And the good news is this morning that Jesus came and he brought the scroll and he, through his shed blood on the cross, gave himself to purchase our redemption. He took the judgment on sin upon himself. He who became sin and took the judgment of sin, the Bible says, so that we could become the righteousness of God. We have a choice in the matter to repent of our sins and to accept the slaughtered lamb's sacrifice. And he wants to come and he wants to put his mark not just on your forehead, but seal it in your heart by, your, by his Holy Spirit that you are a child of God. And he wants you to come and experience that so that the judgment of God that's being here, you will be marked and the judgments of God will pass over you. They won't touch you. Everybody else around you will be experiencing the judgment of God, but you'll walk out free. You'll walk through the fire and not be burned. The diseases will come to everybody else, but not to you. Everybody will wonder what kind of a, what, how come you get to be the exemplar? This is because God has put his protection on them in the judgments that he's sending on the earth to bring repentance. And those who have repented of their sins and have the mark and the seal on the forehead, they will be exempt from the judgments of God. Not exempt from suffering, not exempt from from persecution and martyrdom that the beast and the world will put on you, but you'll be exempt from the wrath and the judgment that comes upon the rest of the world because God has protected you with his mark. That's the message of the book of Revelation. Well, how do I get there, Pastor? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen to Jesus talking to the churches, especially the Laodicean church, complacency, complacency and, and, and compromise in their life. 
Come to me, repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will live and eat and make my abode with them. Repent and believe the gospel.